take your Bibles, please. Open them to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Why will I not start at verse 1? You're about to see why. If you look at verse 1, it begins this way. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham begat Isaac, and you probably would then see that word begat about 2,000 times over the next few verses. And there's a lot of names there that I very well may not pronounce right. It'd be kind of like going to someone's house and they were the guests and they pull out a photo album of people in their life back in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, and we have no idea who those people are. And you'll get very lost in that and say, well, this is something I'm not interested in. Now, there, there might be a picture or two here or there of someone you might know. And, and likewise, there may be a name here or two that likewise you might know. For example, let me tell you, there are two genealogies of the birth of Christ or of Jesus. Both of them go all the way back to David. Um, and we see that uh, Joseph's genealogy is the one we right here in Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And it goes back to David through Solomon, David's son Solomon, who succeeded him as king. Mary's uh, genealogy also goes back to David, but through Nathan, David's son Nathan. So both of them were uh, distantly related to David, but in two different lines. And uh, they connected with David, and then it went back f further from there. But anyway, that's the genealogies, and they are important. Don't think, because I'm not preaching on a genealogy, I don't know if I've ever preached on a genealogy, honestly. And don't think that they're not important, though, because and, and it's very, we need to read them and know what's in there and, and, uh, and uh, to understand the situation. But anyway... All that being said, we're going to go and start at verse 18 as we're looking at the birth of Jesus Christ. So beginning with verse 18, uh, we find now the birth of Jesus Christ. That is his incarnation. If you will remember, he was in, the, in heaven at the throne on the right side of, of the Father in, in heaven. And Jesus saw you and I and saw our sins. He saw the sins of the world. And he stood up and said, I'm going down, Father, to where they are. I'm going down to be that Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. And the way he did it, and you look at Philippians chapter 2, which we looked at recently, so that he had left heaven and came down to this earth and made himself uh, uh, like a man in the body of a man, that is uh, his birth in Bethlehem. That was not the beginning of Jesus. Jesus is everlasting. He always has been, is now, and he always will be. But that is when he was incarnated in the human flesh, when he was born into the Virgin Mary. Why did it have to be a virgin? We'll see in just a moment. We're going to look at a lot of things involving the birth of Jesus Christ. May he bless us as we study his word together here this evening. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It happened in this way. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Now, what does that mean, espoused? Another word for that is betrothal. Let's talk about Jewish weddings in those days at that time. You know, we have what we call engagements, where a couple gets engaged. The man proposes to the girl, and she says yes, and then they begin their formal engagement. When they began to plan the wedding together, and then ultimately the wedding takes place and they get married. And so sometimes engagements may last a year, sometimes they may last two years, sometimes five years, sometimes they may last a day. The way the world is now, people get married in a hurry sometimes. But engagement is just simply a pledge, one to the other, that I want to join in holy matrimony with you and to, to be uh, one with you, become one flesh with you and be married to you forevermore until the death do us part. 
And that is, of course, the custom of us. But in the biblical times, it was a little bit different. Actually, it's vastly different. For you see, uh, back in those days, uh, parents would arrange weddings, as we, we all know this. They would arrange weddings of children. And a lot of times, children wouldn't even know about it. They, they might be out in the yard playing or something. And they don't know that mom and daddy's talking to this other mom and daddy, and, and uh, they're planning a wedding when the children are probably four, five, six years old, maybe younger, maybe as a baby, an infant, who knows. But anyway, so they would plan this wedding, and that is what is called the engagement. And uh, then ultimately they would come to a point where, which is called the betrothal. That would be like a ceremony, and that was very binding. The betrothal was not the engagement, and Mary and Joseph were betrothed to one another. They were in that betrothal stage. And the betrothal stage, that means that they were so committed to one another from this prearranged wedding that the only way they could break this betrothal was through a divorce. They were actually considered married in the betrothal stage. A couple is considered to be married. They just could not uh, cohabit. They could not live together. Nowadays, people just uh, live together and Think nothing of it. But back then, they were very serious about this. And a couple could not cohabit and live together. Uh, we find that uh, at the betrothal, wh wh what would happen there is that the, the parents of the, the bridegroom or the bridegroom himself would give a gift to the bride-to-be. He'd give her a gift of some kind of monetary gift. And what was the reason for that? Because what if something happened to her before they're actually married uh, through the consummation of marriage? The consummation of marriage would happen at the end of the betrothal. And by the way, the betrothal would last one year, always one year. And after one year, the bridegroom would come to get his bride. But before the betrothal would begin, he would uh, give a gift unto the bride. Well, I want you to look at something. I want you to think of something. I want you to think about Jesus in the upper room. When he was with his disciples, and he said to them in John 14, 2 and 3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there I may be also. Now, what happened was, Jesus gave a gift. What is his gift that he gave? The gift that he gave was dying on the cross. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gift of God, Romans 6, 23, it says, is eternal life. So Jesus laid down upon the cross and died. That's his gift for mankind, for whoever would receive it. We are the bride. He, as the bridegroom, gave the dowry, or gave the gift, which was his sacrifice on the cross. After he gave us the gift, he then begins the betrothal stage. And, and let me say to you and I, since we got saved and since he died and was buried and resurrected from the dead, we are committed to him, we are married to him, we are in the betrothal stage. And we will be that way until... A period of time, not a year, because it's been thousands of years, 2,000 at, at least, but he's going to come back one day for his bride. And that will be the consummation of the marriage, is we'll be married to the bridegroom as the bride forevermore. Now, I want us to look then at this situation with Mary and Joseph, with all that in mind. And we see it says, when Mary, his mother, verse 18, was espoused, the word espoused is another word for betrothed. They were in that betrothal stage. Bes, uh, bes, uh, espoused to Joseph. And, and by the way, you know, Joseph, poor old Joseph, he, he doesn't get as much attention. I know Mary is very, very important. She's the virgin who brought forth the Savior. No one's more important than Jesus. Although some... Uh, may think Mary is so holy that she should be before Jesus, but no, never, never, ever, ever, never. Jesus comes first. He's the most important. He's the Savior. 
Mary's the mother who brought him into the world, and she is very important too. But poor Joseph, he just gets left behind sometimes. We see the shepherds on our Christmas cards. We even see those uh, wise men with the crowns. And by the way, they didn't even come until after he was born anyway. They came after Christmas. That's why I'm preaching about that. Uh, well, I'm preaching before Christmas, but anyway, I'll preach it next week. So, but, but Joseph was a very important uh, part of the story. I, I, I know that he was not the natural father of this baby Jesus. It was not uh, uh, a natural birth. And so he kind of gets pushed aside a little bit. But let me tell you something, that Joseph was a very good man. Uh, it says that she was espoused to Joseph before they came together. Does everybody see that before they came together? You know what that means? That, that means they were in the betrothal stage and before the consummation of their marriage, before they began to live together in the same house as husband and wife. But uh-oh, she was found with child. Joseph all of a sudden one day saw his wife in the betrothal stage, not his uh, engaged girlfriend, lady friend, no. He saw his wife. They're married. They're in the betrothal stage, and the only thing that can break that is a divorce. But they just, the only thing different between that and, and what we th uh, look at or know of as marriage is they couldn't live together yet. It's a one-year period. And during that one-year period, she's got to learn to love her, her husband. And that prearranged wedding, she's got to get, he, and he's going over to prepare a place. Remember that passage I read a little bit ago, John 14, 2 and 3, Jesus said to the disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. He's preparing the bride chamber for you and I, the bride chamber. And, and so that's what the groom would do. He'd go prepare the home, the bride chamber, and, and build that home for it specifically in mind of the bride to come. And after about a year, he'd go and get the bride and bring her home to live with him in the consummation of that marriage. But they're not at that point yet. They're in the betrothal stage, and yet she's found with child. But now, of course, we see the latter part of that verse where it says of the Holy Ghost. But I, I'm not going to get to that point yet. I want to tell you something. What must have been going through Joseph's mind. Joseph had to absolutely be in shock. He was probably stunned. All kinds of emotions must have been coming over him. Maybe she had a little baby bump or something. I don't know. And, and, and maybe she came out and just practically just, and just told him, Joseph, I'm pregnant. I'm a child. And that ain't supposed to be, folks. That was not supposed to be. So, and the natural uh, thing of a, of a couple being in the, in the betrothal stage, they were very serious about this. Very serious and very... Very serious. And, and he finds that she's pregnant. Now, all kinds of emotions. He's probably angry. He's probably saddened. He's probably confused. What happened? What happened, says Joseph? Now, he had, he had uh, there were about four different things he could have done. He could have just forgiven her. And said, I love you anyway. I don't know what happened. We'll talk about it. I'll, but I love you. I'm going to marry you anyway. But if he had done that, talk about the rumor mill. People would have started saying, they'd have started talking. Oh, yeah. People who would have known this situation would have said, she, had, she has gotten pregnant by some other man. Or they would have thought, Joseph is the father. And they've had relations before the consummation of the marriage during this betrothal stage, which is you don't do. So a rumor mill would have started if he had married her anyway. And another thing he could have done is he could have made a public shame out of her. What does that mean? Well, okay, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, you don't have to turn there, but you can listen. But Deuteronomy chapter 22, 22 through 24 says this. If a man be found lying with a woman, married to an husband, translation adultery, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so that thou shalt put an evil away from Israel. If a damsel, listen to this, a young girl that is a virgin, betrothed to an husband, that's Mary and Joseph's example, 
and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then you shall bring both of them out into the gate of the city, and you shall stone them with stones that they may die, so that shall put away evil among you. All right, so Joseph could have made her a public example. And it says that in here. Uh, look at verse 19. Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he's a good man, and not willing to make her a public example. He, he could have made her a public example. He could have married her anyway, or he could have made her a public example. Now, would she have actually been stoned to death? Probably not. Reason being is because the Romans were in control in those days, and the Romans had told the Jewish people that we are going to handle capital punishment and executions. Not, you, you can't do that. So the Romans would oversee that, and the Romans probably wouldn't allow that anyway. But she would have been a spectacle. She would have been publicly embarrassed and shamed before all. She would have. So he could have made her a public example. He could have married her. And, or the third option would be he could uh, divorce her, either publicly or privately. He was such a good man, and even though he found her pregnant, he thought, I'm going to divorce her, but I'm going to do it privately, secretly, so that it won't, people won't talk as much, and hopefully we'll keep it quiet, and although we all know word would get out anyway, but still, that's what he was willing to do. So let's look at it. It says in verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, he didn't want to humiliate her. And even if the Romans did allow it, he didn't want her to be stoned to death. So he's minded to put her away privately. That's to divorce her secretly. That's what Joseph had determined he was going to do. But now here's the situation. Yeah, Mary was pregnant, but not by another man and not by Joseph. She was pregnant or had become a child by way of the Holy Spirit. Because this is a God thing. This is what it says in Luke chapter 1 when the angel had visited Mary. In Luke 1, 18 through, uh, 28 through 35, it says this. The angel came to Mary and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. What she means by that, I'm in the betrothal stage. The consummation of my marriage has not happened. I have never cohabited with any man. How can I be pregnant with this holy child, with this Messiah that the angel was telling her she would have or bring into the world? The angel explained it and said in verse 35, The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's what the angel said to the young girl, Mary. How old was Mary? You know, some people believe that she was probably as as uh, young as 14 years old, maybe 14 or 15 at best. A very young girl, but a godly girl, a girl raised in a godly home, a very uh, gentle spirit, a very humble girl, and a very God-centered girl, one that God had chosen. As he did not take this lightly when he chose the mother that would bring his son into the world. Don't you know she had to be a very, very special person? For God to choose her among all the women or all the young girls of the world. So, then we look here, as it says in verse 20. Joseph didn't know this yet, though. Joseph did not know that the angel had appeared unto Mary. He just all of a sudden is in that situation where he finds out that his wife in the betrothal stage is with child. 
What am I going to do? Make her a public example, marry her anyway, start a lot of gossip, or put her away through divorce? I'll divorce her, and I'll do it quietly, privately, secretly. That was his decision. So then we pick up at verse 20. But while he thought on these things, it was on his mind as he lay down to go to bed at night. Couldn't get it out of his mind. He lay down. And then during the night as he was sleeping, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. The same angel that had made a visitation unto Mary makes a visitation unto Joseph. And he said, Joseph, thou son of David. And he was the son of David. Mary was a daughter of David. Both of them descended from David, as we see in those genealogies. But he said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not. Don't be scared, Joseph. Don't worry about this, Joseph. He said, for Mary, fear not to take Mary as your wife and the consummation of marriage at the time that's coming. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The angel said, Joseph, this is a God thing. God has done this by his Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to marry her. God has chosen her, your wife, among all the young ladies of the world that ever have lived or ever will live, to be the mother, the virgin mother, to bring his son into the world. The angel has sufficiently, adequately, fully explained to Joseph, I'm sure, in this situation, that there is no other man. And certainly Joseph knew it wasn't him, that it was God who had done this, and that she was still a virgin, very pure. So he tells this to Joseph. Verse 21, the angel went on and he said to Joseph, and she shall call his name, and she shall bring forth a son, She shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I want you to notice the word his in that verse. We're his people. His people are the ones who get saved. We become his people when we believe in him. And we invite him into our heart and he saves us. He saves his people. He doesn't save the lost that are out there in the world who reject him. They don't get saved. And they can still get saved if they'll call upon him before it's everlastingly too late. But if they reject him, they don't get saved. He shall save his people from their sins. Verse 22, he said, Now, and it says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted as God with us. That was, uh, there we find that the, the, the writer of Matthew is quoting a prophecy by prophet Isaiah 700 years before Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. 700 years, it's a long time. And in Isaiah 714, we see these words. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. This holy child, Mary, did you know this baby boy that you're holding in your hands? That's God with us. Now, notice there, and I want us to focus on this word, virgin. She was a virgin girl. Isaiah said 700 years before she would be a virgin, And here, verse 23, she is a virgin. So we must not look at Mary in a negative way, as I said Joseph probably did at the onset of finding out she's pregnant. But we should look at her with joy to know that she was so pure and holy, set apart. When I say holy, she was set apart by God for this mission. She was chosen by God for a mission. She's to be the vessel that would bring forth the Son of God. And she's a virgin. She had to be a virgin. Why did God choose? To, why, why didn't God just choose a good man and a good woman? 
Because every man and every woman that's ever lived is a sinner. We've all come short of the glory of God. All of us. We are all, we've all inherited the sin nature of Adam. So you couldn't just pick out randomly a good man, be selective about it, pick out a good man or a good woman, and say, they'll be the couple. They'll be mom and dad. They'll bring forth my son. Couldn't happen that way. Because every one of us are in the sin nature. We deserve hell. And the only way Jesus could come and be holy and without sin and to be the Savior was to be born through a virgin girl. And so this is a God thing, as I continue to say over and over. She was pregnant with child as a young virgin girl. Had to be that way or he could not have atoned for her sins. Then it says in verse 24, Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife. Now in Luke's gospel, it says that Caesar Augustus had determined there was to be a census, and, uh, and they were to go to Bethlehem. That was where their, their uh, home was in Bethlehem, where they had to go and, and be counted. And so they go there, and they go to the stable. But don't insinuate or think wrongly that they were cohabiting. They weren't. They were in the betrothal stage. Joseph is just with her. And he walks with her as she's riding on the back of that, uh, that donkey going into Bethlehem. where uh, and, and, and she's getting nearer and nearer the time the birth is to take place. And you know the story and how they made no room for them in the inn. And so they had the stable. And so she goes back there and she has her baby. And it says, he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. They did not have the consummation of their marriage where they began to live together until Jesus was first born. And then they call his name Jesus. The name Jesus is a Greek name for the Hebrew Joshua. And both simply mean God saves. When Mary, did you know that that baby boy you're holding in your hands is Emmanuel, God with us. Mary, did you know that that baby boy that you're holding in your hands, that is God saves. God saves. His name is Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. We get together with families. We, we have dinners. We laugh. We smile. We wear red and green. We exchange gifts. All that's fun. That's what we do. But let us not forget the real meaning of what Christmas is all about. It's about the birth of Jesus. Jesus the Christ. As I close. Breaks my heart. But there are houses all around us. Right now. All around us. In Pelzer. West Pelzer, Piedmont, Williamston, Anderson, Greenville, Atlanta, Charlotte. We can go way on out from here. Everywhere that have Christmas trees in their home. Or have Christmas lights on the outside of their home. And they never, ever attend church. They don't claim to know Jesus as their Savior. And yet they're celebrating Christmas and don't even know what it's about. That's so sad. That's so sad. Let us all do our part. Do the best we can to let people know it's all about Jesus. Let us pray.